Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Phil from the Door of Hope Church here in Maryborough, Queensland, Australia. We pray and hope that these videos and messages are of encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord. Uh, hello to all our people from different regions in the country and the world. Blessings to you from here in Queensland. If you're benefiting from these videos, we'd encourage you to subscribe. And also, if you'd like notification when we upload new videos, we encourage you to ring the bell. If you'd like to make a donation to the ministry, there's a link in the comment section below. We pray and hope from the whole team here at Door of Hope that you be blessed by these videos. Okay, let, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray, Jesus, that as we come to your word, that you illuminate the truth to us, soften our heart, open our mind, teach us your ways, Lord, especially as we're approaching these last days, Jesus, and the way the world is, that you give us wisdom and insight as to what to think and feel and how to act and behave and what we should be doing. Lord, we want to be your servants, your hands, your feet, so teach us today through your word, in your wonderful name, amen. So, because Kerry's not here, I can go to town. <laughs> I don't mean long. Uh, she said, don't, don't preach too hard. You be nice to them. <laughs> yeah, we make a good team. Yeah. So, she's not here, so you can blame her for not being here if I get too tough. <laughs> Okay, I want to start a little um, side or mini-series. So you know how I've been talking about evangelism? Go up to somebody and say, can I ask you a question? I'm on a spiritual journey. I'm curious, what do you believe about God? And learn how to start a conversation with people. And those who want to learn more, you, you know, the person might say something. And you'll be surprised how happy people are to actually tell you what they believe. And then just reflect back and say, oh, so what you're saying is dirt, dirt, dirt. And if that's all you do, because you're a bit scared, no worries, thank you. Just learn how to start to talk about spiritual things within yourself. The next step then is to ask them questions about that. Well, how did you come to that conclusion? Where did you get that idea? Why do you believe that? You learn how to stir up their thinking by just simply asking them questions. So I'm taking a side step from that evangelism. Remember, I've put the challenge out to you to find a Christian friend, sit down, have a cup of coffee and share your testimony with them or share the gospel with them so that when the time comes, if somebody says to you, how do I get saved or what do I need to do to be saved or the opportunity comes, you've already thought out, what do I say to a person? So you need to practice. Now, I've got a feeling that I need to give you more time to do that so I'm going to take a little sidestep and I'm not moving on from that point until the Lord prompts me to say, yeah, people are ready for you to move on from that point, which means that could be the end of evangelism. Evangelism is not like other things. You can't, you can't teach it like a course. You can't sit down and do a 10-week course on evangelism. Evangelism is very hands-on. It makes no sense unless you're starting to talk to people. And so I encourage you, even if you're too scared to talk to non-Christians, then practice talking to Christians. Just get used to being able to share the gospel, talk about Jesus Christ. It surprises me down the green, um, the people who come and join us who have never spoken out aloud in public, how scared they are, but there's no one around and there's nothing happening. Just speak Jesus. And so overcome you for Satan. Satan has used your flesh to cause you to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Christ is with you. So I'm taking a sidestep until the Lord prompts me to move on. But the sidestep is related to evangelism because it's a false, another form of false gospel or false teaching that has crept into the church and has laid a foundation for many of the problems. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about us. I always think more universal, you know, the majority of Christians. Obviously not all churches are in this category. And it goes something like this. Now, when I started uh, preparing for it, I thought this might be a one-off Sunday sermon. I'm up to 38 pages of notes. <laughs> so I'm not going to get that done in one day, so you might walk out. 
<laughs> yeah, you need a bigger coffee, you need a bucket. So I realised as I started delving into it that this issue is a lot bigger than what it appears on the surface. The comment I'm about to make is very simple, very straightforward. You've probably heard it many times before. But as I started to work through why is this a problem and what's going on, where has this come from and uh, is this true, is this right, are we on track or would you, do we need to shift a little bit? Now I'm going to preempt your thoughts with remember how Satan works. Satan doesn't come to you as Christians with an outright blatant lie straight up. What he does is he comes with a subtle shift in perspective. So let's say here's the truth. Like, and I'm looking at that truth from this perspective and from this perspective it, it needs to be said a certain way and understood a certain way. You go around the other side and look at it from the other perspective and it looks different. This could be like an object that's green on one side, red on the other side. One person sees a green object, another person sees a red object depending on where you're standing. So what Satan does to deceive people, he speaks truth from a different perspective and speaks it into your perspective and it's actually not true, but it sounds true. Let me give you an example. The Garden of Eden, a lot of people say that Satan lied. He didn't. He told the truth from a certain perspective. And she understood it, that's Eve, understood it from her perspective. And so that deceived her and she disobeyed God. Satan is absolutely cunning. So what that means is for especially all the biblical warnings that you know of as we come towards the last days. The one warning, the first thing that Jesus said, make sure you are not deceived. So in other words, deception is the sign of the last days as we draw near to the end. So therefore we need to be really sharp with our thinking in terms of is that true? And from what perspective is that true? So the comment is, goes something like this and it has changed over the years. God loves me for who I am. That then grew into God loves me just the way I am and then that grew into God loves me unconditionally and then that grew into it's all about love. Let me ask you a question. Is that true? Sounds great, doesn't it? God loves me for who I am. Sounds on the surface like there's nothing wrong with that. We know that God loves so let me reassure you before I get stuck into this because some of you might be getting nervous. He's about to say that God doesn't love us. Let me reassure you that God is love and that he does love us. I'm just going to oh, praise God. <laughs> I've got to say it. There you go. You can tell Kerry I was nice to them. <laughs> 1 John 4, 8 and 16. You know them and I'm, this is not what I'm going to preach and I'm just laying this so you can never accuse me through this series of saying God doesn't love you. I'm going to say straight up God loves you. 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. All right? It's black and white. God is love. Verse 16, this is 1 John 4, 16. And when we have known and believed the love that God has for us, the love that God has for us. So if you go back to our first statement, God loves me for who I am. Sounds nearly the same, but it's not. So in, in 1 John 4, 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. All right, I'm, I'll preach more on these later because today my only aim is to show you what the problem is and then we'll be explaining. So what's going to happen is, you know how Satan, he takes you off on a little tangent, gives you that deceptive little difference and then you play that out and where does it end up? That has been played out over the last 50 odd years and we're at a certain point. I'm going to jump right up to the end point and show you something that will absolutely horrify you today. And I prayed, <laughs> I really needed probably Gary's wisdom, so blame her, she wasn't here. Lord, should I, should I show the congregation this or not? Or just talk about it? Well, so when I was praying about that, I... Um, and just waiting for an answer and I moved on and I was watching something else on YouTube because I tend not to watch telly anymore, I control what I watch. And there was a street preacher and these young kids came up and were asking him questions which showed me outright that they have been told this idea. That, and it was, I felt like God saying, this is a problem, this is an issue, you have to address this, you can't skirt your way around this. So it'll become clear. 
But before I show you a movie, I want to I need to show you what the problem is first, then we'll go back to the starting point. So let me just explain theoretically first what the problem is. If we say that God loves us unconditionally, then he accepts me and loves me just the way I am. Now listen to this. I was born gay and Jesus loves and accepts me just the way I am. And if God loves and accepts me just the way I am, so should you. Now, I'm going to put a different word in there because the one I'm picking up, which stands out the most in our society, is the LGBTQ, I think I've got them all, community. But I was born a liar and Jesus loves and accepts me just the way I am. And if God loves and accepts me just the way I am, so should you. So I can stay in my lying. I was born a thief and Jesus loves and accepts me just the way I am. And if God and accepts me and just the way I am, so should you. I can stay being a thief. Do you see the problem? So God's love, and it's far more complicated than this. I'm gonna, it's going to take me weeks to unpack this and explain this. I thought of it like this. Anyone know the old game Pick Up Sticks? Yeah, that's what I feel like. Here's the sticks of all this doctrine and I've got to somehow get them out without, without causing all your belief in God to just crumble into nothing. I've got to sort of get the stick out without touching other things. The love of God and the understanding of this is connected to a huge amount of other doctrine and belief and practice, but the problem is real. So the video we're about to play, I'm just going to read through some of the things that they say in this video. It is going to disturb you. Okay, so, so if you get too disturbed, shut your eyes, look down and just pray and try not to listen. Um, so they say pride. First of all, we know that the Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So the whole slogan for um, you know, pride in the LGBT is completely against what the word says anyhow, just from a start, but anyhow... So this is a message, this, they're going to sing a song. This is a message for those working against equal rights. Well, we're perceived as being working against equal rights. You think we're sinful. Well, actually, I know you are, because all people are. Uh, we lead lives you can't respect. Well, that's debatable. But you're just frightened. So, fr- so try and understand from their perspective, all they see is people who are afraid of us. You think I'm sinful, you can't respect me, but the reason you're saying that is you're frightened. Now I can tell you categorically, I am not frightened of someone from the gay community. I will witness to them as much as I would anyone else and I don't feel like I'm going to catch anything or get anything off them. I know they need Jesus just as much as everybody else needs Jesus. I personally never look at or think of LGBT, um, gay (laughs) people, let's just say gay people, I never think of gay people different than anyone else. I'm not afraid of them, so, but, but they have to come up with some way of rationalising in their mind our preaching which says, all have sinned and you need to repent. And the Bible's quite clear that your actions are sinful, you need to repent of those actions and change. So they, they can't process that message. So the way they're processed it is to say the only reason you're really saying that is that you're afraid of us and you're against us. So it goes on and sing, they sing, you think we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked. He sings, we'll convert your children, we'll make them tolerant and fair. So they see, the gay agenda sees their agenda as making the world a better place. It's making the world fairer, more tolerant, more loving. This is the world that when you make the comment, God loves me unconditionally, that is the world you are saying that comment into. I've taught at secular um, high school with the boys. They just, without any flinch, say to each other, like, have you tried being with a guy yet? Like, have you, have you had a girlfriend? Like you and I in our younger days might have said, oh, have you got a girlfriend? Well, they sort of say, have you tried a guy yet? Because you won't know until you try it. And they see absolutely no problem with it because they are raised in this environment. So they see then any non-acceptance of that as hateful 
and uh, you're, you're not loving, you're not caring, you're not respecting, you're just afraid. And this is in the song. We don't know why you would be so scared of us turning your children into loving, caring people. They genuinely believe this. The world is getting kinder, and what they mean by that, the world is getting kinder because the gay agenda is growing. Learn to love. So that's why we can't just say it's all about love because the concept of love in the world is now so distorted, it's nothing like biblical love. It's nothing like the love that you may have known in church 50 years ago. The world has changed. So you can't say, if I said to the majority of you here, God loves you, you know what that means. You have a certain way of thinking about that and that God is love and that God loves you. You think about it a certain way. If I say that in the world, they do not think of it the way you do. It means something completely different. So that's why this expression is such a problem. Learn to love. Someone has to teach them not to hate. Your children will care about fairness and justice for others. Your children will work to convert all their sisters and brothers. Your kids will start converting you. And that's converting you to the gay agenda of standing beside gay people and being proud of their decision, affirming them. You don't have to worry there is nothing wrong with standing by our side. Yes, there is. The last verse in Romans chapter 1 says that not only is the sin, this sin judged, but also those who approve of the same. So we can't approve of this behaviour. It makes us as guilty and as implicit in the sin as those who practise it according to the word. So we can't stand beside you, beside you and affirm you and say this is okay. Now, it's a real problem because I can understand from their perspective why they then see us as hateful because they don't see life like we do. They don't understand things like we do. All they see and hear is you're being unkind, judgmental, fearful and as soon as you say anything like that, you're a homophobe and so we can't even speak into the conversation. We're just cut off as people who are fearful and hateful, which is not true. Get on board in a hurry because the world always needs a bit more pride. <laughs> from, a, from a Christian perspective, that is so twisted. That's the exact thing the world does not need. Pride is the root of all our sin. Our decision to turn against God is rooted in our pride. It was the pride of the fall. It was the pride that caused Satan to fall. So no, we don't need a bit more pride, but what they mean is accept who you are, be proud of who you are. Stand with us and be proud of me. Don't make me afraid of who I am, that you'll persecute me, that you'll hate me, that you'll judge me because I'm gay. And I understand that perspective, but the problem is they're not understanding our perspective. They're seeing everything from their perspective and they're working hard. Is it because it's... Has it been approved down in Victoria yet that it's illegal for gay conversion therapy? If not, it's coming. I know it's in the pipeline for it to be stamped out. So it's only a matter of time before it's actually illegal in Victoria for me to say to somebody who's gay, repent of your sin of being gay. Stop practising that which the Lord hates. It's now illegal for me to say that in Victoria. That's where we're at. So before we do play the video, a little bit more... The video, literally before your eyes, will show the fulfilment of the prophecy in Luke 17, 28. You may want to turn to that one. Luke chapter 17, verse 28. Luke chapter 17, verse 28. Luke chapter 17, verse 28 to 30. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, the main point of that verse is that the world is continuing on up until the return of the Lord with no sense of that. 
Suddenly, the Lord returns. And it says he comes like a thief in the night. That coming like a thief in the night is not to believers, it's to non-believers. The word says that you are of the day, you are of the light, you will know the hour, you will know the time, you will be able to discern the times. Christians should know the Lord is about to return. The Bible teaches that. But what it does teach is that those who are non-Christian, those who are not truly born again, don't study the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, have no idea what's about to come upon the earth and suddenly the Lord comes. Even so, it will be the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When Lot went out, they were judged and destroyed. So as in the days of Lot. Now, So the more important one is suddenly it will come. But I think it is fair also because he uses Noah just before this, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man, that one of the sins that was causing Lot so much trouble in Sodom was their homosexuality. But more than just homosexuality, that those, those who don't participate or accept or get on board with it are seen as you know, divisive, hateful. You're outside the group. There's prophecy of Lot being grieved by this depravity because I know when I show you this video, you're going to, you're going to be distressed. <laughs> but relate to Lot. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 8, I'll let you turn there, Second Peter chapter 2, 1 to 8. Second Peter, it's up towards the back of your Bible, chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. And I think, you know how some of you because obviously the way I'm preaching, I'm conservative. Some of you would look at the more liberal churches who have appointed gay and lesbian priests and ministers and so forth, think, how are they doing that? They are doing that on top of what I started with, God loves me unconditionally. So when they overemphasise that love, therefore he accepts me as I am, so therefore I can be, sin basically disappears. The, The breakdown and separation between God and man is gone, God just loves us and so when you hear the expression it's all about love, it's just throwing out the understanding of Christianity and basically we're a good loving Christian community. And so then, but there are also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you. We are told time and time and time again that in the last days there will be false preachers and false teachers. I'm going to show you over the next few weeks some of the things that people say, like Joyce Meyer, Joel Olstein, Rick Warren, um, Brian Houston and others, the comments that they make fit into this category because they, I've, I'll just pick one that I remember that really stood out to me, Brian Houston. You know, I came from AOG and have listened to his preaching and stuff in the past. And he said, we don't want to... People know about sin because their life is hard enough as it is. They're struggling in life. We don't need to remind them of sin. And as I was hearing him preach something like that, I thought, you don't understand sin because their struggle in life is not actually their sin. Their sin is causing that struggle in life. The people that I talk to when I say, do you think you're a good person? Every one of them says yes. People don't know that they're sinners. They think they're good. Especially in our society where we've got this sort of middle class Western society. So they fall into, because what they're then doing is they're, false, they're preaching a different gospel they're, and they're starting that gospel from the wrong perspective, false teachers. Second Peter 2, but there were, also, there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. So they're secret, in other words, they're hard to spot. And even denying the Lord who bought them. And you think... People aren't denying Christ, are they? You can go to, say, a particular church and you can find buried in their webpage somewhere right at the back some comment about how Jesus died on the cross for people's sins, but you never hear it preached, you never see it taught, nothing, it's buried. Because here it says, destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Who bought them. That means purchased with a price, purchased with the price of his blood. 
So why are we being purchased? If the gospel message is more God loves me, God has a wonderful plan for my life, just ask Jesus into my life and he'll help me with that wonderful plan. That's not the gospel because there's nothing about being purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So false preachers, false teachers bringing in destructive doctrines and bring on themselves swift destruction and many will follow their destructive ways and many do. Millions of people are following these preachers and so, so this is the other problem with this is that you see the crowd and you think, straight away I think, well, that's not actually what the Bible preaches. The Bible says that wide is the path, many follow it who lead to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to eternal life, hard to find, few find it and difficult to follow. So if it's easy and all these tens of thousands of people are listening to this easy message that says God loves you just the way you are and he has a wonderful plan for your life, they're not saved because they're denying the truth right here in front of our very eyes in Scripture. They are denying the fact that the Lord bought them with his blood. And why? That makes no sense unless you face the truth of things. That gospel is just a deceptive thing. Verse 3, by covet covetousness they will exploit you with deceitful words. Covetousness for the money and the fame. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and the destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, that's where the ancient world destroyed by the flood. You know, some Christians go, well, we can't even cope with the idea of a God who flooded the world and killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people, but saved Noah. That's because they don't understand God. They don't understand the holiness. They've change God into this God loves me unconditionally. It's not like that. But save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So God brought in a flood in on the world of the ungodly. He is holy and he is judge. He doesn't just love us unconditionally. There is a condition. The condition is the blood of Jesus Christ. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example. So Sodom and Gomorrah is an example to those who afterward live ungodly. You're about to watch a video of people living ungodly. This is prophesying them. You're going to watch prophecy before your very eyes unfold. An example to those who afterward who, who would live ungodly lives and delivered righteous lot who was oppressed by, by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Verse 7, this is the part I want you to pick up on. And delivered Lot, so he delivered Lot out of this, but Lot was oppressed. In other words, he was distressed. There was a burden on him, and the burden was the filthy conduct of the wicked. So here's a righteous man who is being tormented by the wicked behaviour. Now, it's not just... Home, I'm picking on this because it's the easiest to do with a video. But, but it's not just that. It's the violence, it's the drugs, it's the alcohol, it's the broken lies, it's the lying, the stealing, the cheating, the killing, the selfishness, the greed, the lawlessness. You know, you, life, we are sinful. And so therefore those who are rejecting Christ are just being handed over, according to Romans 1, to their own evil desires. But, that, but we can't then... This is why I preach about your wretchedness. Because if I stopped right there, a religious person will turn around and say, like the uh, Pharisee who said, thank you, Lord, I'm not like that person. So that's why I preach about sin all the time. So that you will not judge these people. That you will not elevate yourself above these people because you are not above these people. You have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. He has given you a heart of repentance. He has given, he has given you the desire for holiness. That is not coming from you. Men do not desire holiness and righteousness. None seeks after that which is good in Romans chapter 3. So therefore we wouldn't either, except for the grace of God at work in our life. That's why we have to have a firm, solid understanding of the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of total depravity, our wretchedness. Because then when we tell other people about Jesus Christ, there's two things that it empowers us to do. One is to not be self-righteous, which also then means you can preach about repentance from sin in love. Because I've been saved by the love of God. 
you can be saved by the love of God. And then when I preach to the ungodly, I can do it in love, even though I'm talking about sin, judgment and hell. But if I didn't understand my own sin, my own depravity, I would elevate myself and it would be preached in pride, arrogance and self-righteousness. So you have to know your own depravity to be able to share the gospel into a depraved world. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing the lawless deeds. Okay, so I'm going to play the video. As I said, if it disturbs you too much, just look down, shut your eyes, block your ears, la la la. (laughs) Sorry if this offends anyone. Now, don't let that disturb you too much. I've brought it in here to show you so that you understand the issue, the problem. The problem is when you say that God loves me unconditionally, you are speaking into that world. Everybody outside of Christendom, vast majority, when I say everybody, it's a generalisation, who knows, 80, 90, like, that's huge. There's not too many people I would talk to who would say that um, there's a problem. No, there's not a problem. The world is becoming a lot more loving, kind, accepting, affirming place because of the gay agenda. So when uh, you don't accept that, you are hateful, spiteful, judgmental, fearful and homophobic, which is not true. I love all those guys there as much as I do everybody else that we preach to down on the street. Everybody who is outside the kingdom of God needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I don't think that I'm... So what you've got to be really careful with is that you don't become self-righteous judgmental. Matter of fact, there's quite a high possibility that some of you here without Christ would be part of that community. That's the reality. Jesus is the one who works in us by the Holy Spirit to produce righteousness. That is why I speak about sin all the time, because it keeps us grounded. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the one that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit and transform and changes our life. I can't sit in judgment of anyone, but I can judge the truth of the gospel. I can judge according to the word, and the word is quite clear. If you'd like to turn with me to first. Corinthians, um, I think it's 1 Corinthians, yep, chapter 6, verse 6, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Going to read a few verses. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. So don't be deceived with this agenda. Neither fornicators nor adulterers, idolaters, sorry, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you just stop there, verse 9 and 10, it would sound like, therefore, I need to not be homosexual and I'll be saved. And some Christian people make that mistake of thinking by not being homosexual, you're going to heaven. That's not what this is saying. I could go to all the other verses that list sin and and lying appears quite often. Have you ever told a lie? Yes, you have. All of us have. So therefore, according to the word, if you take that literally, all of us are going to hell and no one is being saved because all of us have lied. So you can't just pick out homosexuality and say if you're not a homosexual that means you're going to heaven. That's ridiculous. It also lists uh, idolatry and adultery and thieving. Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever downloaded something off the internet illegally? Have you ever stolen it? If you've stolen something according to verse 9 and 10 you're not going to heaven. This is why you have to understand what the gospel is. 
And when people say that God loves us unconditionally, they preach a slightly different gospel. Let's go on to verse 12, sorry, verse 11. And such were some of you. In other words, God loved people enough to make a way for them to come out of the sin, come out of the unrighteousness into salvation. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So God's love demonstrated to us is to make a way for people to come out of sin, lawlessness and unrighteousness into salvation and then have the glorious gift of the Spirit within you that gives you the desire for holiness. That's why evidence of salvation is a transformation. You no longer desire those things, even though you might struggle with homosexual desires. There's plenty of men who struggle with addiction to pornography, which is probably even worse, who have to try and fight to turn away from that and say, no, Lord, I want righteousness, I want holiness. The only way to get that is because you are not holy. The only way to get that is to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Help me, Lord, to get, break free from this. Fill me with your spirit, because it says, and by the spirit of our God. God comes into you by your spirit. This is what salvation is. As Jesus died on the cross and took your sin and placed it on, in his body on the tree, past, present and future, but he also gives you of his spirit. And the word cl is clear that Christ dwells in you by the Holy Spirit and you in Christ. We are one, as Jesus prayed in John 17. So therefore it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. True, born again salvation by the power of the Spirit of God to cause you to desire that which is holy and righteous, which you would never do apart from Jesus Christ. So therefore, when we preach to all sinners, no matter who they are, repentance has to be a part of salvation. Repentance has to be a part of salvation. So when we say, God loves me for who I am, and I'm going to unpack this in more detail because there's an element, remember, Satan deceives by saying the truth from a certain perspective. From a certain perspective, that is true, and I'm going to explain what that is. But from the perspective that most people hear it and understand that it's not. And that turns into God loves me just the way I am. Well, from a certain perspective, yes, and another perspective, no. And the same God loves me unconditionally. Well, from one perspective, yes, and another perspective, no. So you've got to be more careful than that and, under, and ask the question, what do you mean by God's love? And what do you mean by loves me? And what do you mean by unconditionally or he loves me just the way I am? So the first sort of question to ask about this, because I want to leave you on a more positive note, is God's love his primary attribute? Because when people say it's all about love and God is love, is love God's primary attribute? And what I mean by attribute, who is God? God is holy, God is just, God is wrathful, God is wise, God is loving, God is eternal. Um, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my God, my provider. There's about 30 of them I've got here. So the mistake a lot of people make is to think of God and go elevate one attribute over others. As soon as you do that, any one of them, if you elevate any attribute of God over another, he ceases to be God. Because God is fully all those attributes at the same time, always and eternally. He is God. So therefore, don't think of it like God has 80% love and 5% wrath. If you do that in your mind, then the concept that you have of God is not God. God is 100% loving and 100% wrathful. And you need to learn how to understand God in the way the Bible explains him to us. But this idea that God loves us unconditionally, because what happened, preachers start to have this realisation that the world was shifting. And so to keep, pardon the crass of the expression, bums on seats in order to make lots of money, because some of these guys make, I think some of them are worth like net value of $700 million or something, to do that, we've got to change the message because the message of you're a wretched sinner destined for hell, God is going to judge you and Jesus died on the cross is not, is not attractive. You know, I often think that when I'm reading the Gospels and I link back, Jesus, you need a PR person. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so many preachers and people and leaders in church think that they're going to help God 
We're going to fix up your message, Lord. We're going to make it a bit more palatable. We're going to tell people that God loves them unconditionally because they're happier with that. So be careful. This is the gospel that is primarily preached that caters to this problem. And this is Rick Warren's, and I think Rick Warren, that um, purpose-driven life, purpose-driven church, caused so much damage, it's unbelievable. This is the idea. God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Ask him into your life and he will help you with, and then just dot, 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 whatever your plan is. Help you with your marriage, help you with your work, help you with your health, help you with your loneliness. So the idea that came out with, in that period of time was let's stop talking about hell, let's just go to the benefits, let's talk about, um, because we know that God has given us you know, I hear of so many Christians who have restored marriages, set free from alcoholism, healed by the power of God. The benefits of being in Christ are enormous. Let's sidestep everything, offer the benefits and say to people, God loves you. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Just pray and ask Jesus into your heart and into your life and he will give you those desires of your heart. And so you, you, we know that we all desire significance Well, let me tell you, that desire for significance is rooted in your sinful nature. That's pride. So therefore, the basis of that whole movement was pride. God come into my life to make me significant? I thought the gospel was Jesus come into my life to save me a wretched sinner and glorify yourself, not me. Humble yourself for salvation. So this this, this feeds into the pride of men. You sit there and you hear a message you love because you like it. And so they, and then there's the preachers which we talked about, be discerning in the last days, false prophets who will come and say what you want to hear. So be careful that you're not wanting to hear a particular thing because that sets you up to be one of those people who has itching ears and will go and find someone to tell you what you want to hear. This is a sales technique. If somebody's dying from cancer, I can pretty much guarantee you that I could probably fold this piece of paper up. I won't fold that one. I still need to read that. No, I need to read that one too. I could fold this piece of paper up to someone who's dying from cancer and say, I've prayed over this. This is anointed. Um, if, you, if you donate $1,000, will you slip that under your pillow and have faith and the Lord will heal you of your cancer. They'll take it and I'll get the $1,000. Why? Because people are desperate. And when you're desperate, you hear what you want to hear. When you really want to hear something, you'll hear it. And the salesmen know this. They know, they can pick people who have this, I really want to, and they will tell you, I can give you that. Just do this or this and you'll have that. That's a sales technique. And that's what these con artists are doing. They're they're conning vulnerable people. So don't get sucked in to the idea that the gospel is about God coming into your life to give you what you want because you don't, what you want stems out of your pride, stems out of your sinful nature. You can't be trusted. I can't be trusted. This, the sin in, in Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is that he hands us over to our own desires. So then why would the gospel be a presentation of God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, ask him into your heart and he'll give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart are evil. The the message is false. It's a false gospel. It's a wrong teaching. So some people who come to me and say, stop preaching about hell so much, not that many of you do, it usually goes to Kerry and then to me, (laughs) because you know what I would say. Um, So I'm going to tell you what I would say. Truly born again Christians rejoice at hearing the truth about sin. Truly born-again Christians rejoice at hearing the truth about sin because it reminds them of such a great salvation. But people who say, stop preaching about sin, you're too much in the flesh. You're still too much of you alive because a dead person, dead in the flesh, alive in the spirit, rejoices at hearing, yes, I'm a sinner saved by grace. (laughs) Hallelujah. Jesus has saved me. So sin for a truly born again person is a rejoicing message. It's not an oppressive message. So if you feel oppressed when I talk about your wretchedness and your sin, that means you're not understanding salvation yet. 
Your wretchedness, your sin, that should make you as a born-again believer rejoice. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, I was just saying the other day to someone, I don't know how anyone gets saved because we're so depraved in our thinking and our attitude and when we're preaching and we see people just ignoring and walking past, living their life, who, who turns to Christ? Who turns to God? Who desires righteousness? No one. How on earth did I get saved? <laughs> Praise God. So a true born-again believer rejoices at hearing the preaching of depravity and sin because they realise the greatness of their salvation. I had no hope apart from Jesus Christ. So if we are to share the true gospel with people, we need to become comfortable with the truth, comfortable within ourselves, about ourselves. This empowers us to preach the gospel without contempt, without a sense of self-righteousness and without a sense of superiority. But when you want to avoid the truth to simply make yourself or others feel good, then you're fallen for the trap. Don't share a gospel with people and change it and leave things out because you know it's going to be offensive. The gospel is offensive to non-believers. It is. The word's quite clear about that. Jesus, that's why the false idea of Jesus having come to bring peace is false. He hasn't come to bring peace. He's come to bring a sword. And that's what he said himself, I've come to bring a sword to separate people, to separate people from those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. Those who live in darkness and those who live in light. Those who live in the lie of Satan and those who live in the truth. The gospel, the coming of Jesus Christ was to separate people, not bring peace to the world. He's not, he's not a world peacemaker. So the idea God loves us and God loves us all and God loves us just the way we are and you have this utopian idea that Christianity is going to bring love and peace to the face of the earth, it is a lie from Satan. That is not what Jesus came for. What, if that was true, then why does he prophesy a new heaven and a new earth and that everything will melt away except the word of the Lord will abide forever? The truth will abide forever. Jesus has come to save sinners like you and I. So therefore those of us who have had our eyes opened and our hearts softened and somehow Jesus has given us the capacity to say, yes, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, will rejoice with the Lord forever. That is why we're here, for eternity with Jesus Christ, not the things of this world. So if you get trapped into the idea of a message that says, come to Jesus and he'll help you with this or he'll help you with that, is that really why he came? To help me to have a bigger car, a better house, a better wife, a better job, more significance, heal me from my sickness or whatever else? No. He came to save you so that you might be with him where he is, to live eternally with him in the kingdom of heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. As Jesus lived on the earth and we looked at the prophecy of Lot and Noah and how as in the last days so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man for like Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. If you believe the Bible history, which is clear, like I like what Alan read from Isaiah. You can actually go to a Bible museum and see that proven to be hundreds of, written hundreds of years before Jesus Christ. We have clear evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. So if you believe the Bible to be the Word of God, then you've got to hear what it says after that. Suddenly, the Son of Man appears. As in the days of the Son of Man. We are in those days. That video shows us that we are in those days. There is ample evidence I can give you that this is the generation that will see the return of the Lord. Now, even if I'm wrong, most of you will probably be dead before, you know, like I'll probably outlive most of you, hopefully. So <laughs> some, of the, some of the younger people might be able to come and challenge me in 20 years and say, you said Jesus was going to return and he hasn't. So I'm fairly safe in an older congregation, but young people, if you've got a good memory, don't hassle me too much in 20 years, okay? So... If I'm wrong, that'll, the, the result is the same for us. This is what I said, I think, last week. How do we live in light of everything that's going on? Exactly the same as always. Die to self, live for Jesus Christ, preach the gospel and serve the Lord. So that when the day comes, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And he won't say, who are you? I do not know you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If you affirm that, you are practicing lawlessness. And, and so, you know, if you... If you are able to affirm that and there's no guilt in you, the Holy Spirit is not going, hey, that's wrong, that's unholy, that's unrighteous, that's not right. If the Holy Spirit is not convicting you that that is not right, then something is wrong with you. 
And you need to get on your knees and pray to the Lord, say, what's going on, Lord? You clearly say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that the people who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then why am I so happy to accept it? Why am I even saying that it's okay for ministers to be gay and homosexual? Why am I saying that? Why have I believed this lie? What has happened to me? Is there no righteousness in me? Because when I read your word, I see your holiness. I see your righteousness. You hate this. You hate sin, you hate liars, you hate murderers, you hate thieves, you hate homosexuals, you hate sodomites, you hate this sin. And I'm going to show you the verses because we're running out today. It literally says he hates the sinner who does this. Now, don't believe the lie that God hates the sin and loves the sinner. That's not true. I'm going to show you in a few weeks. It clearly says in Scripture, God hates the sinner. Why? Because that's where the sin comes from. Who does he cast into hell? He doesn't cast your sin into hell, he casts you into hell. God hates the sinner and hates the sin. It is another lie of Satan for you to sort of worm your way around this issue and say, well, God hates the sin but loves the sinner, so therefore I can say God loves everybody. We're back to the same problem. God is holy. God is just. Now, if, if you believe that gospel message, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What about God is absolutely holy, God is absolutely just, all have sinned, the wages of that sin is death, hell is real, the wide path leads to damnation, we need to repent of our sin, die to ourselves, uh, not seek after the things of this world, weigh up the cost, walk the difficult path that is narrow, strive to enter through the narrow gate and share in Christ's suffering. Where's the rest of it? It's not there. It's a false message. It's an empty message. So many people I meet who said they've tried Christianity and when I find out they haven't tried Christianity at all, they've tried that lie. Is God's love his primary attribute? No. The attributes of God are absolute. It is not like God. He doesn't have 80% love and 5% wrath. God is fully, listen to this, God is fully all things, completely, all things at the same time. He is not like us. We take what we know of God from Scripture, and Scripture is quite clear. He is fully God. He is not like us in this sense. We are fickle, on the other hand. We swing from one emotion to another. We swing from one thought to another. We swing from one behaviour to another. I'm just going to close because I want to leave on a more positive note. But remember, if you're a true born-again believer, everything to this point is positive because you've been saved. The attributes of God. I'm going to go through them down the track. Jehovah, Jehovah Makadesh, infinite, omnipotent, good, love, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, immutable, transcendent, just, holy, Jehovah Rapha, self-sufficient, omniscient, omnipresent, merciful, sovereign, Jehovah Nissi, wise, faithful, wrathful, full of grace, our comforter, our shadow, father, the church's head, our intercessor, Adonai, Elohim. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we pray, teach us, lead us, guide us. We pray, Lord, because we know the coming, the days are coming of your return and the light will shine brighter in the darkness. So we pray, let the light of truth shine shine brightly in that darkness. Protect us from the deceptive, cunning ways of the enemy, Lord. Help us to love truth, to love righteousness and to submit ourselves to your word and to your ways. Help us to grow through this series of teaching to know you more and to clearly understand who you are and the way things are working. In your wonderful name. Amen.